Hello and welcome to Forgotten America, a podcast about the many places that get flown over, driven past, or just plain forgotten, and the people who call these places home. In each episode, we'll diagnose the unique challenges faced by rural America and unpack and explore the solutions to those challenges. We'll also share the culture, stories, and perspectives of forgotten Americans, from the hilltop to the holler and the desert to the delta. Fred Franson is the president of Huntington Junior College and co-founder of Sertel, Inc. He also previously served as executive director at the Center for Excellence in Higher Education and as senior fellow for Liberty Fund. He has been working to make breakthroughs in how to improve education at both the K-12 and higher education levels. Garrett and Fred talk about the role of junior colleges and the reformation of education in the United States, particularly about changes Fred is making at Huntington Junior College to incorporate civics and great books education into the college's programs. Fred shares about the defining role the fall of the Berlin Wall played in his realization of how important freedom is and how that moment led him to the University of Chicago, which underscored his future career in higher education reform and philanthropy. They also explore Fred's time in a small town called Eureka Springs, Arkansas. Welcome, everybody, to another edition of the Forgotten America podcast. I am your host, as always, Garrett Ballinger, President and CEO of the Cardinal Institute here in West Virginia. And I'm joined today by Fred Franson. Fred, you're a man of many talents, uh, a lot of different experiences, and that's why I wanted to have you on. But before we get into all that, why don't you just tell people a little bit about kind of who you are and what you're doing right now? Yeah, I have uh, been working in education and philanthropy since I finished graduate school at University of Chicago in the 90s uh, in a variety of ways. Uh, I worked for an educational foundation, Liberty Fund, for a long time. I then worked for the Philanthropy Roundtable and have been really trying to think about ways in which uh, we can make some breakthroughs in how to improve uh, education, both at the K-12 level and, uh, and in higher education. And the most recent piece of that puzzle that continues to grow is that in uh, March of of, uh, 2022, about a year and a half ago, uh, I took over Huntington Junior College in Huntington, West Virginia. So I now feel like I'm a a co-citizen of this state. Uh, I split my time between Indianapolis and Huntington and have really gotten to enjoy, you know, getting to know the people in the state. So I want to, before we get into that, and that's why I wanted to have you on, is to talk about kind of the role of junior colleges in, in the reformation, I think, of, of education in our country, mostly for the for the better, I would say. And then also, you spent some time in a pretty eclectic town called Eureka Springs. And to kind of pull the curtain back for listeners, Fred and I had dinner a few weeks ago in, in Huntington, and he was describing this place to me, Eureka Springs, Arkansas, which I had never heard of before. And I thought this is a perfect episode for what we're trying to do here in Forgotten America, kind of dive into some of these cultures of these places a little bit more. But before we get there, you said you went to University of Chicago in the 90s. Now, for those unaware, University of Chicago is has been known for a very long time as kind of a mecca of free market economics, of uh, kind of classical thought, classical education in some ways. So, Fred, let's just rewind a little bit. What was it like going to University of Chicago in the 90s? Yeah, so let me back up half a step. Um, so uh, I went to college in Kansas. I grew up in Kansas. Uh, and then I spent three years in Brussels, Belgium, between 1988 and 1991. Um, and for those of you with a historic mind, uh, this podcast is being recorded on November 9th. Uh, November 9th is the day the Berlin Wall fell in 1989. I um, haven't counted the number of years it was since then. But in any case, uh, that was a defining moment in my life because I recognized, first of all, how uh, how important freedom was and also just how, uh, you know, anybody who had any second thoughts about whether people really wanted to be free or didn't really want to be free. All you have to do is watch what happened uh, on uh, on November 9th, 1989. And all of these people went storming through uh, the Berlin Wall when it finally opened up. Uh, And, uh, you know, any any doubts about which what people prefer. Uh, are are immediately quenched. Um, in fact, there's even a great movie made about it, uh, which kind of plays the reverse. The movie's called Goodbye Lenin, and one of the plot ideas is a family has to hide from their their uh, hyper 
East German mother the fact that the Berlin Wall has fallen. And so they, she accidentally sees people storm, uh, streaming through the wall. And she says, what is that? And they say, oh, everybody's breaking into East Germany because they've realized how much better it is. So in any case, that really defined what I was interested in intellectually and, and, and also otherwise, uh, and led me to the University of Chicago, where I studied in a program called the Committee on Social Thought. And so uh, the Committee on Social Thought kind of combines the things, the two things that you're describing. It was uh, or is uh, the Great Books graduate program of the University of Chicago is created by Robert Hutchins and Mortimer Adler uh, with the idea in mind that there are a lot of questions that social science was supposed to be answering that weren't getting answered. So middle of the 20th century, they look around and if, if you go back uh, around 1900 is when the Political Science Association, the American uh, Sociological Association, like all, all of these associations in the social sciences were, were formed around 1900. And then suddenly, you know, their job was to predict when humanity would do important things for the good and for the bad. And then, you know, 15 years in, they miss World War I, and then they miss the rise of Nazism, and then they miss the Holocaust, and then they miss the killing fields, and all of these other kinds of things that are going on that ought to be the subject of social science. So Adler and Hutchins kind of stood back, stepped back, and they said, well, what's going on here? And maybe we need to be thinking about the forest and uh, a little bit more and a little bit less about the tree. So they created a graduate program where a few students get to spend a few years reading you know, important, critical, seminal, if you will, books in the field of, of human, social, and political endeavor, uh, and do so with scholars who, at least when I was there, were typically at the end of their careers. So they weren't out in this publisher parish uh, world. They were really wanting to pass along their wisdom to, to younger students. So I got a chance to study with Alan Bloom and with Saul Bellow, two of the great minds of the, of the 20th century, uh, when Robert Fogel, uh, a Nobel Prize winning economist, was there. My dissertation advisor was the leading um, historian of the French Revolution at the time, Francois Fioré. Uh, and, and so it was just a really incredible experience. But the other thing that connects what you said or asked about is that the Committee on Social Thought was by design a place for people that didn't fit in. And uh, by, what, by that, what I mean is uh, one of its professors was a classicist. David Green, and he was a professor teaching classics at University of Chicago. And the classics department, as the, the legend goes, was getting ready to fire him because he actually wanted to teach what was in the books rather than the language. Like, you know, Herodotus and Thucydides have something to say to us. We should really, you know, consider what, um, what Aeschylus was talking about and what implications it has for us. And, you know, in the classics world of the time, you just taught the language. You didn't teach the meaning. And so they were getting ready to fire him, and, and Hutchins said, no, 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 you can't do that. I've got this other place for him. We're going to stick him to the Committee on Social Thought because he doesn't fit in your discipline. But specifically, uh, when Friedrich Hayek was, uh, was moving to University of Chicago, uh, obviously he should have been in the economics department, You know, one of the really famous free market economics department. Milton Friedman was there at the time. Uh, but the economics department said, Hayek, you're not enough of an economist to be in the economics department of University of Chicago. But then they said, but we've got this other place for people who don't really fit in. And so Hayek's appointment was actually in the Committee on Social Thought. Now, I was, he was long gone from, from the committee and had died by the time I was studying there, I believe. Uh, but uh, but that, was the, that was the place for him. So it was designed as a program for people to, to think out of the box and specific, specifically to do so in a way that allows you to think about some of these bigger questions without all of the baggage that goes along with the kind of the minutia of, of uh, peer-reviewed scholarship and, uh, and, um, and a kind of a publisher parish world, um, but rather to say, you know, what kind of a society do we want to live in? Um, in the case that I was looking at is what does it mean to found a, 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 new, a new country or a new polity? I was looking at East Germany, but I was also looking at the European community. Um, what is political founding? I, you know, I think we today live in a, in a world in which the foundations of this country, the Constitution in particular, um, are is under great attack. Uh, and it's under attack both from the left and from the right. This isn't a partisan issue. You know, do the principles of the founders still matter? Uh, and if they do matter, uh, in what way do they matter? Uh, are they, do they matter for the good or do they matter for the bad? And so 
as I'm thinking about education, I think it's really critical that we, we think about those fundamental questions. And we do so in a way that's non-judgmental. You know, people think about, you know, the, the, the common conversation about the Constitution is, you know, we have the longest Constitution in the history of Constitutions. It's been around for hundreds of years, you know. Another way of thinking about it is we're living in the Second um, uh, Republic of this country. So if you know any French history, France is currently in its Fifth Republic. Uh, the, and, uh, and in between its republics, it had, you know, a directorate, it had an empire, it had a few monarchies and so forth. And so every once in a while they would have a republic and then they would have something else and then they would go back to a republic. Well, we in the United States are in our second republic. The Articles of Confederation were the first one. The Constitution is the second one. There's nothing to say that we're not ready for a third one, but we should ask those, fun, you know, those fundamental questions. What is it that, it that we would be giving up? What is it that we'd be looking for? And would we be better off if we, if we made those changes? So my time in Chicago was spent you know, thinking about those kinds of things. Uh, and it and it led me to, uh, to you know to really be interested in what kind of education is suitable for uh, for young people and not so young people as they're trying to you know learn about ways in which they can contribute to addressing the problems of our time. So when you look back at your time at the University of Chicago and you're 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 meeting with folks like Alan Bloom who wrote a very famous book called The Closing of the American Mind and you know Friedman was there, George Stigler, Hayek was there previously. Can you directly tie to what you learned at a place like that with kind of where, what you're doing today, whether it's building a company, whether it's purchasing a junior college hundreds of miles away from where you live? I mean, just kind of thread that for me, because I think that's fascinating. Yeah, and, and I wouldn't leave out a Liberty Fund as part of that story, because uh, interestingly, again, I'm not sure if your audience has ever heard of Liberty Fund or knows what Liberty Fund is, but but I spent about 10 years working for an educational foundation that was derived its mission almost directly from the Great, Book Founds, Great Books Foundation and the, the, same, the same project of, of Adler and Hutchins. And there's, a, there's a longer story behind that. So there are a few things. First of all, very specifically, we in, at, at the Huntington Junior College, or HJC as we like to call it, are in the process of uh, applying for approval of a new classical liberal arts degree. We are hopeful that we will have that degree approved. Uh, it'll be a two-year uh, degree in classical liberal uh, ideas in, and in a classical liberal arts framework. Again, we're hopeful that we will get approval. If so, we will launch it in September. If not, it may take a little bit, a little bit longer before we get through the whole accreditation process. We're, but we're in the middle of that right now, and we're, we're optimistic about it. As we designed that program, we designed it around the question uh, what is it that a student after his or her first two years of college, what is it that they need to know in order to be a productive uh, citizen, a productive family member, a productive member of society? Uh, and what is the context in which, you know, the educational context that they need to have in order to understand some of these questions, particularly questions about, you know, who we are, what do we stand for? Uh, and also, you know, what are the things that made, to the extent that who we are is a good thing, um, uh, what are the things that are essential to preserving that or developing it or, or restoring it? Uh, and so we believe that you know, every student should have uh, a real grounding in some of these core ideas so that they can make informed choices. You know, we don't want to define what those choices should be. But we're very much opposed to you know, getting into the kind of propaganda game. We want you to come to our college so we can recruit you for our side, whichever side that would be. Uh, but rather, we want to equip people with the tools they need in order to make decisions about some very, very important questions that we're we're facing. So this two-year degree will will be informed uh, by a lot of the same principles, at least that that led to the creation of the core curriculum at University of Chicago, and and informed at the graduate level the program that I I engaged in. We'll be using Socratic discussion as part of the program, but at the same time, we're wanting to use technology as a way to make it affordable and accessible to to everyone. Um, other things that we've done, one of, one of the very first things that we did when we took over the college was rethink some of the structure of the catalog. Prior uh, uh, owners, we, we bought the college from a set of for-profit owners, but we've converted it to nonprofit. So we're a private nonprofit uh, uh, college uh, in, in Huntington. But 
for some reason, they were requiring more hours than were necessary for an associate's degree. Most of our programs are associate's degree program. We trimmed that off. We had been uh, asked by the accreditors to rethink the general education requirements uh, of our programs. And when we did that, uh, we went about creating a new certificate in civics that in, uh, asks all students to take a course in American history and American government and basic economics and in, in what we call personal growth and development. We uh, have launched, we launched that certificate almost right away as soon as we were able to put it, to put it in place uh, already last summer. And along with other changes, we issued a new catalog. Now, uh, if you've been to college and you've been in college at a time when they, uh, when a new catalog was being issued, students are given the choice about whether they want to continue and complete their degree under the catalog that was in place when they started or whether they want to switch to a new catalog, uh, to, the, to the new catalog and use the degree requirements for that. And interestingly, we had quite a number of students who specifically asked to switch to the new catalog because they had a, 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 a strong interest in this new civic certificate. And so one of the things that we found is that that even at a junior college or a two-year college uh, there is a desire on the part of students to get a kind of grounding in basic basic things uh, and that was a real uh, that was you know it validated a lot of the things that we were thinking about and that we were, we were hoping in a way that we didn't expect to have validated quite so quite so quickly or so uh, uh, obviously the other thing that was interesting or a couple of other things that were interesting is that we began talking to employers, and when I first uh, began regularly coming to West Virginia, uh, I had three concerns, uh, things that I thought would be barriers that I needed to overcome in order to make the college a, a success. Uh, the first was, you know, I talk funny. Uh, are the people in West Virginia going to welcome me, even though I've got a Kansas accent or my parents were Canadians, so there's a bit of Canadian in there somewhere, but I certainly don't talk like somebody from Appalachia. Um, nothing could be further from the truth. I felt incredibly welcome. Uh, I, I love getting to know uh, people in Huntington and, and beyond. And again, I felt very, 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 very welcome in, in the community. The second consideration or question that I had was, uh, will employers be reluctant to hire our graduates? And so we began talking with employers and, uh, and it was exactly the opposite. Uh, what we heard consistently was, how soon can you get us more qualified graduates? You know, we're eager to hire people. We don't have enough. We've got jobs, but we don't have people. Uh, we're really desperate for, for your graduates. So how, how many people can you send us how quickly? And then I asked them what they were looking for. And this was the surprise because the college that, that we took over was offering primarily technical degrees in um, you know, business fields, uh, but but more in health related fields, so medical assisting, dental assisting, uh, substance abuse counseling assisting, uh, medical coding, those kinds of things. And what every or virtually every employer I asked said to me was, those are all things. You know, the technical side of that education are all things that are important. But the truth is that they're going to have to do a lot of training on that anyway. Uh, what they're looking for is people that have that show uh, a strong uh, sort of values, if you will, people with a you know a willingness to show up to work on time, people with a willingness to work hard when they're at work, people who are good at problem solving, who, when confronted by an angry patient or an uncomfortable customer, uh, will be able to resolve the problem instead of having to go to the dentist or the doctor or the office manager or the store manager and say, "I can't manage this. You have to take care of the problems." So it turns out that these kind of liberal arts skills that, uh, that we're building and enhancing in the program are precisely those skills which employers are working for. And that runs very much in counter to the entire narrative about workforce development and job skill, you know, skill, jo skills ready training and those kinds of things. Uh, that, you know, there's been a long conversation about the need for uh, job specific skills training and workforce development and so forth. That is all about, you know, make sure they know the names of the instruments and can lay out the dental tray in the right way, but don't really pay attention to the question of, uh, of character, the question of problem solving and, and so on. So we think 
that that what we're doing in terms of general education, we're also rethinking some of the requirements for the other programs to make people more, uh, give them more of an education in what professionalism is, what good citizenship is, um, what it means to be a good student and what it means to be a good person. Uh, so more of a holistic uh, response. And, you know, we may turn out to be wrong in this, um, but if we're right, we're going to make Huntington into a real uh, beacon for how to how to rethink the first two years of of higher education. Well, that's certainly a lofty goal, and I but I but I think it's a it's a worthy one. And whenever you and I had first met, and I was informed that you were buying a junior college, I sort of forgot about junior colleges, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to talk to you because it seems like now you're either it's high school or straight to college or it's high school, maybe an apprenticeship somewhere, right? Or uh, something of that sort. But like this, this concept of a junior college is alien to a lot of people. Are you aware of sort of the original purpose of junior colleges, like where they came from? And then, you know, we're sitting here in 2023. I think you gave a really eloquent response in, in terms of what you want Huntington Junior College to be. But just the role of a junior college and sort of that 20, 21st century education landscape kind of moving forward, right? Because you have a lot of forces going on right now. A lot of people are very disappointed and skeptical, right, of the value of a four-year degree. It's extremely expensive. You're having a lot of people starting to question what's being taught at a lot of these four-year institutions. So it's kind of a two-sided question, Fred. What was the original conception and purpose of a ju junior college? And then where do you see it going from here? I don't have a lot of you know, precise information about the origin other than uh, you know, we in this country have, have not followed a model like the European apprenticeship model uh, or uh, you know, other places that focus on trade skills that start much earlier in in the school experience during high school or even at the end of uh, in the junior high. So community colleges were designed to fill in that gap and provide technical training, but also to be a community college in the sense of uh, providing enhancement courses for adult learners who aren't specifically seeking any other other kinds of degrees. It's also a place for which is much more open. We are open enrollment, but which is much more open enrollment than a, a, a typical four-year college. So a lot of our experience has been that our students often have tried a four-year college, or they've even tried another uh, community college or junior college, and they find them too big and too anonymous, and uh, and they're simply not successful in that environment. So it's designed as an environment for people who aren't quite ready for a four-year big anonymous educational experience, but at the same time recognize the value of, of an education. So it kind of fills in that gap, um, but it's a much um, maligned area in terms of uh, a lot of, you know, very few people who graduate from uh, a graduate, finish a graduate program with a PhD would aspire to teach in a community college. You know, they aspire to be in a tier one research university and and they're not student centered in their in their mission, whereas junior colleges are very much uh, student centered in their mission. And increasingly, they're filling a space where there had been a long period of time in which high schools had reduced their vocational technical training, and uh, and so students that wanted to get that didn't have any place to go, or it wasn't it was in, inadequate for um, for the kinds of jobs that they were wanting to be to be prepared for. But as we move towards uh, recognizing that a four-year degree isn't right for everybody, or maybe put a different way, we don't need as many people with four-year degrees as our four-year degree granting institutions would like to see uh, studying with them. Then the question becomes, okay, if not a four-year degree, do you go straight from high school into the workplace, or do you do something else in between? And uh, and junior college is one of those something else is in between that's an option for for a lot of students. We find again, I can't take credit for this because these are students who were uh, you know in in Huntington Junior College before my time at the college certainly can take credit. But we have a lot of people who enroll with us. Sometimes they come and go a little bit because it takes them a little while to kind of get their educational their their student chops back. Uh, or maybe they never had them when they were in K-12 education. And, uh, but they get a foothold and they recognize the value of, of, of an education. And they quickly move from completing a degree with us to enrolling in Marshall or somewhere else 
to going on to graduate school to getting great jobs. And, uh, and it's, it's been remarkable the number of people who I've met in the community who say to me, oh, I got my start. At, you know, I, I enrolled here. Uh, it didn't work out. I wasn't ready for you know, X. But then I enrolled at Huntington Junior College and I got my degree. And then I went back and I did get my four-year degree from X. And, uh, and now there are leaders in the, leaders in the community. Uh, that's a, a not a not, that's a, a a fairly common story that I hear when I'm in when I'm in Huntington, and I also you know I have a Google alert for Huntington Junior College, and what's been interesting as well is that probably about you know every few weeks uh, I'll get an obituary, and the obituary will be from somebody who uh, you know died in Florida, and then it'll say so and so was born in 1930 whenever, and uh, you know when grew up, went to Huntington Junior College, and went on to live this very interesting, successful, successful life. The college was formed in 1936. And so we've got this incredible history, you know, such that our, our, our alumni are now uh, at the end of their life. And they show this story about people that weren't ready for a four-year college or a four-year educational experience. If they get the right start, it can take them on to, to some incredible things. This may be a bit of a pugnacious question but and I, i'm sorry to kind of spring this on you but do you think the, the the necessity for junior colleges is indicative of a failure of our traditional schooling system because when i hear what you're doing which i think is a beautiful thing the classics you're teaching kids about civics the american founding strong values that should it can we not teach that in 13 years, nine months a year at a traditional school? And then you couple that with other civil civic society institutions, whether it's churches, obviously the family itself. I, I think what you're doing is a wonderful thing, but I'm a little bit just sort of disappointed that we can't inculcate those sorts of things in 13 years, nine months out of the year. No, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, and in fact, you know, a lot of what we end up having to do because of those failures is remediation. Um, but let's imagine that remediation wasn't wasn't the problem. You know, everybody does graduate with all these things. I have I have two children. One is 23. One is 25. Uh, as I think most of us who've paid the premiums on car insurance know. Uh, you're treated differently after the age of 25, particularly as a male, as you are before that. Uh, I don't know uh, how much, how often, Garrett, you've gone back and read books that you read when you were young. But uh, when I've gone back and read things that I read, uh, you know, let's say, you know, need not be, it could be Dostoevsky's brothers Karamazov, um, but it could also be Dune, right? You know, the next Dune money movies coming out. I was a huge science fiction fan when I was in in uh, in middle school and high school, uh, and so you know I've gone back to reread some of the some of those classics. I went back and read Lord of the Rings when the Lord of the Rings movies were were coming back. You read them very differently depending on your age and your experiences. So I think that it is the case that there are things that you learn differently when you're a little bit older that that you cannot capture in middle school or high school. And so repeating some of the same information is, is not a bad thing because you won't have learned it right the first time. Now, that's not to say I, I'm a huge fan of uh, the idea of apprenticeship. Uh, I, think, uh, I also think it's, it's really critical for people to, um, to take time off. You know, the idea of going to 13 years of public school and then immediately going to you know, two years or four years of of college, and then immediately going to graduate school. Um, that's not the way to learn. Uh, you're gonna you're gonna actually sacrifice your learning. Uh, we get a lot of students who come out of, have come out of the military. They're much better students, uh, partly because what the military te the discipline that the military teaches them. But part of it is just that they're a couple years older, uh, and uh, and so the idea of of kind of packaging everything into 12 years. Uh, one, I don't think you can do that because you just aren't going to get it. Let me give you another example. One of the one of the uh, courses that really that we've developed that that really kind of captures our philosophy about things is is uh, our basic economics course. 
And uh, this is something that we offer for high school, stu high school teachers to use in their classroom. And we're beginning to use it with the college as well. Um, but the, the, the course is built around the book Common Sense Economics. And Common Sense Economics was, was written by a professor at a four-year college. Uh, he wrote it because he was standing in front of this classroom of college students, you know, 500 students at Florida State University, Jim Gortney is his name, uh, teaching them intro to micro, intro to, intro to macro economics. And thinking to himself, you know, all of this stuff that I'm teaching them, uh, that they're having to study for and take tests on, is all built around the first course in a sequence that leads to becoming a PhD economist. The percentage of people in my audience that are going to become PhD economists is close to zero. And so what am I really doing here? And so he stepped back and said, economics as a field has a lot to teach you, but uh, that's going to be useful in your life. Uh, but it's not what I've been teaching you to make you into an economist. And so, you know, what are the things that are useful in life lessons? Um, and uh, a lot of that is includes personal finance and, you know, cost benefit analysis. And there's no such a thing as a free lunch and, and so forth. Well, we have teachers that are teaching that to middle school students and high school students. And we've ourselves taught it to high school students and to college students. And it's remarkable how few students how hard it is to get some basic economic concepts. Uh, and, uh, and one of the reasons it's hard is because increasingly or decreasingly, students don't have direct experience in real jobs. Uh, and so as a consequence, you know, absent that life experience, they really don't understand the economic principles that inform you know, compound interest and, and savings and taxation and, and so forth. So, so part of it is, you, you know, you just have to gain some experience before some of these subjects are really going to make sense, you know, to, uh, you know, until you've had deeper conversations with your, your, um, uh, your family about your own heritage, uh, some of the things that are taught in history books won't make sense. And they just take some time to, you know, to, to simmer those. Yeah, one last thing that I would say about this is that, I, I am of two minds. I'm sort of torn because on the one hand, uh, a lot of what's happening in colleges across the country is a waste of time. It's, it, it's, it's crazy that these credentials are required for so many jobs. Um, uh, at the same time, I, I uh, uh, sort of started doing non-traditional things when I was still a senior in high school, taking time off, traveling, um, uh, I took three years off between college and graduate school, uh, and I don't regret a moment of that time outside of the educational system. Uh, I think I was a much better graduate student because I had these life experiences as well. And so if there's a way of doing it that doesn't put you into debt, uh, I think it's really advisable to most young people to not rush into more education. Uh, instead, look for other experiences, get a job travel, um, you know, be a street musician in Paris, um, you know, go and, uh, uh, you know, work on a salmon boat in Alaska, just do some kind of crazy stuff. Don't get yourself into a debt to do it. Uh, and then think about what kind of education that you really are going to need, not just for your job, but also for your life. Um, and uh, so back to your original question, uh, I, I, I absolutely agree that our K-12 schools are failing. Um, if they were successful, that would allow us at the college level to focus less on, you know, who, you know, who was Thomas Jefferson and what's, what were the articles of confederation and more on, you know, one of these questions that we talked about, uh, or I mentioned at the beginning, you know, in our, in our, you know, in our second Republic, are we ready for a third Republic or not? Like, that's a question that you need a lot of information to think about. But you also need to look around and say, well, you know, do I trust these crazies to go off and write a new constitution? You know, are we better off? You know, how does the how does the phrase go? You know, the devil, you know, instead of the one you don't or something along along those lines. Yeah, we prefer the devil we know to the devil we don't. Yeah, exactly. But 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 those are the questions that are on the table right now in our in our country. The only thing the country can agree on is that we don't want either of our two leading parties candidates to be the next president. Uh, um, then how do we answer that devil you know versus devil you don't know question? So none, of, none of the above seems to be the American public's answer. So how do we get to that as an, as an option? Oh, good stuff. Yeah, I, 
don't want to leave. I don't want to leave on that somewhat depressing note on in terms of presidential politics. So one of the other things I wanted to talk about was this place that you spent a lot of time called Eureka Springs, and you were describing it to me. I thought to myself, we've never had anyone with any really significant experience in the Ozarks. And that's that's a that's an important region in this country in, in many ways for cultural reasons and, and many, many other reasons. It's a lot like Appalachia for a lot of reasons. And so I thought, well, I got to get Fred on here to talk about this this place called Eureka Springs, because it was pretty obvious to me you really love this place. And so can you just tell our listeners a little bit about Eureka Springs, how you ended up there, and then we'll kind of dive into it? Yeah, as I said, I grew up in Kansas, south central Kansas, a little town called Newton. And, um, you know, one of the things about Kansas, for anybody who's driven across the country, is there's not a whole lot to do there. So in the winter, our family would go, you know, skiing for a couple of days on the eastern side of the Rockies. And in the summer, we would go to Beaver Lake in northwest Arkansas. Um, so we started going there in, uh, in 1980 when I was 14 was the first trip. Uh, my dad had a my dad had a colleague who was just building a cabin there. And we went and visited him, and then the next year we started renting his cabin uh, every year. And I've been there with just a couple of exceptions. I think one year when I was living in Belgium, and when our son was born, we didn't go. But other than that, I vacationed there. Been there every summer since 19, 1980. Among other things, I learned to scuba dive there. Uh, for all of the people in Kansas and a lot of Missouri and uh, and elsewhere, it's the clearest lake in the area. And so most of the, you know, the dive shops that teach scuba diving, they'll do their their lake checkout dives at Beaver Lake because it's a it's a better place to go and do your deeper, deeper dives. But uh, I did fall in love with the place. Uh, it's It's really, really beautiful. And among other things, it is, you know, there's another big lake between it and everywhere else. And so as a result, uh, you know, if you're from Dallas or, you know, Tulsa or Oklahoma City or Kansas City, there's an easier place to get to. So the people that end up in Beaver Lake kind of really want to go there. And the town that is closest to Beaver Lake on one side of the lake is Bentonville, Arkansas, where Walmart was founded. Uh, when I first went there in 1980, Walmart was just a few stores. Today, it's changed a lot and it's changed that side of the lake uh, a, a tremendous amount um, but the other side of the lake is this little town called eureka springs and eureka springs is is really a unique place uh, in the sense that it has a little bit of everything and it's not really um you know it, it is certainly in the midst of the ozark mountains if you will although they're not really mountains but it's in the midst of the ozarks but it's got a lot of people that have come there for other reasons or, or people that come there for other reasons. So there's this interesting mix of locals and uh, transplants and, and of guests. So in terms of the locals, to just give you an example, I, was, I had a, law, a, tree, I have a, a lake house there. Uh, and uh, we had a tree fall across our driveway. We cut it up and, and, uh, and loaded it up on a trailer and took it to a local sawmill. Well, the guy who's running the sawmill, you know, looks like somebody from the Ozarks. I'll let you use your own imagination on what that would look like. But, you know, very shy, among other things, or, or you know, not a man of many words, let's put it that way, but does great work. And when you go, went out to his, his, uh, his sawmill, you know, every time the sawmill broke, he just built a new building and, and then, you know, added another saw, another mill. And so there's sort of you can you can see the history of the place based upon all the falling down prior prior buildings that he worked out of. Well, that's not uh, there's nothing extraordinary about that. I'm sure there are lots of similar kinds of things, except that I learned from one of my neighbors that uh, that that this man and he since uh, died, but he was known in Germany as the person who produ produced the best blanks of wood for Germany's very very high end um, wooden flutes. So you have in the midst of, you know, what looks like moonshining territory, a guy wearing overhauls with a long beard who's producing, you know, the, the raw materials for some of the finest musical instruments in the world and is known globally for that. Uh, Eureka Springs is at the very end of one. So that's a local. When we bought our property, there was a little shack that the prior owner had loaned out to a homeless man. 
They had hard, they had a hot wired telephone and electrical power into this shack. Uh, and he was just letting this guy live on this property. Um, just because that's what you do to people that have needs is you help them out. He was gone by the time we moved and we've since torn the shack down. We keep running into these buried electrical wires that we're not quite sure what to do with. When, uh, but Eureka Springs is on the northern end of one of the best motorcycle roads in the country. And, uh, and Fayetteville, or uh, uh, the area, is home to what I think is now called the Bikes, Blues, and Barbecue Motorcycle Rally. I believe it's the second largest motorcycle rally in the country after Sturgis. Um, and it's a big deal in September. Uh, when we happen to be there in September, it's just nonstop bikes. They camp on the on the Fayetteville, Bentonville side of the lake. And then it's a, you know, a full day motorcycle ride through through Eureka Springs. Uh, when they're driving through Eureka Springs, they'll pass the Crescent Hotel, which had uh, a, a charlatan operating it as a hospital for a while. And they uh, at least they used to run ghost tours out of it. So if you're into haunted houses, there's a, a Victorian hotel that had a morgue in its basement uh, and had a guy selling all kinds of crazy, crazy cures. Um, there are uh, lots of churches because the local people, it's part of the Bible Belt. Um, and uh, and these, uh, you know, there, there are lots and lots of people of faith that live in in the area and uh, and and that works very well. Um, I have a, a one of my dad's, my dad also lives in the area. One of his neighbors uh, surprised me a few years ago when he says, well, we come to you. We don't come to Eureka Springs for the lake. We don't actually like boats, um, but we love the music. And I was like, music, what do you mean? There's a great music scene in uh, in Eureka Springs. And the uh, the music scene was featured in a story that CNN.com ran uh, a few months ago uh, on Eureka Springs. Uh, and they focused on how could all these Bible thumpers, how is it that you end up with a, a really, really great, you know, I call it almost a country or a, a punk bluegrass uh, bar that's run by a, uh, at least uh, at the time of the CNN story, was run by uh, a transsexual. Uh, you know, how is it that that's tolerated? Well, the reality is, is that the community is incredibly tolerant and it's just as happy to have its, you know, hillbilly, um, a sawmill operator and its transvestite bluegrass band uh, host and its, uh, you know, the Thorn Crown Chapel, which is a beautiful all glass chapel up in the hills where you can go and get, you know, every bit of a revival sermon every day of the day of the year. Um, all of those things work and they all intermingle and, and everybody gets along really well. Um, I've asked myself a few times, how did this come about? You know, how did how did this eclectic group of people um, discover the place? And I don't know that this is the necessarily the answer to it, but when you're on your way to the sawmill, um, you sort of drive down a road that takes you past uh, one of these exotic animal farms. You know, I, uh, if you've seen um, uh, whatever the tiger, Tiger King, Tiger King, yeah, I, I, I don't want. I've not been there. I don't want to make any judgments about. What they're doing there, but there is such a, a private uh, exotic cat park uh, in the area. You go past that, you get to the cell, cell station, you make a right, and you end up at the California Church, and then you make a left, and you're at the sawmill. Well, the California Church is on the way to what was at one time a very famous nudist colony uh, on Beaver Lake, uh, and um, and so there also is this kind of counterculture side to the side to the city or to the to, to the town. Um, and that adds to its adds to its charm. The, the nudist colony is not there anymore. Um, there are still nudists occasionally. It's not without it's not without its nudists. But everybody kind of uh, kind of gets along, and and that makes it a really a really cool place to go and and visit. It's only a couple of thousand people, um, but it's it's a uh, it's um, an area where you get the very best of you know what I would call flyover country which is, you know, as somebody who grew up in the Midwest, somebody who, who, who loves West Virginia, um, who loves Arkansas, um, what I think people from the coasts don't really recognize is just how well we get along with each other and how much tolerance there is, which is, you know, different from inclusion. You know, tolerance is just, hey, you do your thing, I'm going to do mine, but, it, but as long as you don't bother me, I'm not going to bother you. And if you have great burgers and great bluegrass, I'm going to come 
and listen, you know, come on, come and listen to, uh, uh, listen to the music in your bar. And, uh, and we won't, you know, and, and, you know, that, that's just a really, a really special kind of thing. Well, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on here to talk about that, because you just look around and, and everything is becoming more atomistic. It, it's becoming more balkanized. And then you sort of ask yourself, well, where is this happening, right? Where is the balkanization happening? It's online. It's in places like universities, right, that are ostensibly there to foster debate, right, and kind of reasoned argumentation back and forth. And that's not really where we see it. But where where you would expect the fighting to happen, where you would expect the balkanization to happen, like where people are living, breathing, eating, working, is actually where people are getting along. And I, I'm curious, do you have a theory on why? Because in West Virginia, so like if you, if you just do West Virginia as sort of an avatar of itself, well, okay, it's very red, low education levels, MAGA everywhere, uh, kind of go on down the line, right? But when you're here, it's not like that at all. There, there's sort of this sense of kinship with one another. There's this sense of that we're kind of all in this together sort of respect for one another in, in, a, in a very serious way, I think. So in Eureka Springs, is there, how was it able to exist like that? Is there sort of an unspoken, unwritten code there? I mean, just kind of, kind of walk me through your theory on why it's just so darn uh, amenable to everyone. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's, well, first of all, I don't think it's unique in that respect. I mean, there are a lot of unique aspects about Eureka Springs. Um, the kind of combination of counterculture with conservative values is is unusual. Oh. Well, I got to push back. You, you, in in one paragraph, you basically said nudist colony and thorn crown chapel. So that is that's indicative of how unique it is, right? Yeah, but but I I think given it, well, yes. So it, it it's unusual in the fact that all of these things happening are in close proximity. But to me, it's not unusual because the things that are necessary for that to work, I find present all over the middle part of the country. And so given the right, given the right um, conditions, I can see Eureka Springs being replay, you know, re reconstructed in lots and lots of parts of the South, in lots and lots of parts of the Midwest. I have trouble finding it reconstructed in San Francisco or Greenwich Village or um in parts of the coast so I, I i find the opposite um so that's what i mean when i say that you know the circumstances that made it made it possible are this combination of it's really beautiful so it's attractive to visitors um i also think it's it's uh whenever you're in a destination you know a a vacation destination you have a core of people whose job it is to make life fun for the visitors and then you have the visitors and so uh in this case eureka springs only has a couple thousand people the sign says a couple thousand people um uh, i'm not sure if i presume that's during the winter it doesn't include tourists because there are probably more than a couple thousand hotel rooms uh or motel motel beds in it so you've got this you know everybody's here to make our visitors happy during the summer primarily uh, and the spring and the fall. And then in the winter, you've got people that are in a really small town where either you hate each other or you get along. And, uh, and most of the time people in small towns like, like each other. Uh, and then on top of that, you've got, you know, this really creative community, kind of arts community that has been brought in by some of the counterculture stuff. And that, you know, that creates this implied, implied tolerance. So that, that is, you know, that would be true of, of any place that's a, you know, has a, has real seasons in terms of the population, but I also think that the but then I, you know I would add to that that the that there is this notion of of people who've lived on what has was much more recently the frontier, uh, you know much more recently it's much less populated in general, is that when you need things you need your neighbor to help you and it doesn't matter what your neighbor you know, believes on Sunday, it doesn't matter, you know, how they dress. Uh, if your car won't start and you need somebody to jump it, then you need help and you go to your neighbor. And if you're, you know, you get stuck in your driveway or you get sick and you can't get to the store to get groceries, then you have to rely upon your neighbors. And so that, 
relying upon other people um, also creates a sense of tolerance and a sense as combined with a sense of community. It's it's sort of both a close knit, but it's also hey, listen, once you know, once I'm done helping you, then just you know, keep your distance and 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 I'll I'll do my thing and you do your thing. All right, beautiful. Last question here, Fred. Let's let's say that you're the head of the Eureka Springs Tourism Council. Somebody listening to this, they've got three days. You've you've explained the the town quite well. It's beautiful. They want to be there. What is the ideal kind of three day visit to Eureka Springs look like? Are there go to restaurants? Are there go to fishing holes? Just kind of what does that three day vacation look like for somebody? I would definitely stop in the Thorn Crown Chapel, get a 15 minute revival sermon. It's beautiful. It doesn't matter whether you're religious or not religious. It gives you a real great you know, view of the Ozarks. If you're interested in the hunting, fishing side of things, uh, there's uh, there, uh, there are record striper bass in the lake, and below the dam there are record brown trout. There are lots of rainbow trout as well, but there is really great fishing. Uh, it takes me about 15 minutes to get to the the river to do trout fishing, and then I end up you know standing next to somebody who flew in from. Northern California or from uh, Dallas or Houston or something like that. And uh, they, they may, you know, they're, they're paying thousands of dollars to do the same thing that I just have to make sure my truck starts to get down to. Definitely check out the live music. If you're there during the time of, if you're there on the right, right days and, and uh, of the week, uh, it's, it's really, there's some spectacular jazz, bluegrass, uh, other kinds of things. Um, as far as restaurants are concerned, I'm not going to make recommendations because we don't do a lot of eating out, uh, but there are a lot of great, uh, are a lot of great restaurants. My favorite one just closed. Uh, and so I won't recommend, I won't recommend that to disappoint people. Um, it's also that the town is an old, uh, uh, you know, it's Eureka Springs. It was a place where the people went to initially for medicinal purposes. And, uh, and so that's got a great Victorian old town. You should definitely spend half a day just wandering around the gift shops and the artist studios uh, and, uh, you know, grabbing, grabbing uh, something to eat in, uh, in old town Eureka Springs. If you're into ghosts, I would do the ghost tour. Um, we like to spend a combination of time on the lake. Uh, what's, well, I, what we find especially great about Beaver Lake is that except uh, on weekends and when um, when uh, it happens to be a holiday, uh, it's it's there really aren't that many boats out there. Uh, now, having said that, I don't want to encourage lots and lots of people to go out and change it. Um, but we really feel like we've got it to ourselves through much much of the week, and so just kind of hanging out on the dock is and uh, and and going for boat rides is is lots of fun. There, if you don't have a boat, you can. There are some boat rides you can take. Um, and then lastly, I would say there's a great private cave uh, to go visit. Uh, there is a passion play. I've not been to the passion play, despite having been to Eureka Springs since 1980, but my father vouches for it. He's been there many times with guests. Um, uh, and uh, and if you want a more commercialized version of bluegrass, there are, there are a few shows that are designed around uh, around tourists. And then finally, maybe this is the second finally, if you have any interest in street bikes, uh, uh, is uh, it is one of the best motorcycle roads in the country um, to drive south from Eureka Springs down towards the, I think it's Interstate 40 through Ozark National Forest towards Hot Springs. Um, it's, uh, it, it's just a windy forest canopy paved, very well maintained, uh, maintained road. Uh, the um, the bikers are increasingly riding trikes instead of bikes. Uh, you know, the, the population that's uh, big into motorcycles seems to be aging, but it's just a really, really great way to go if you'd like going for a drive. When I picture Eureka Springs, I I think a lot of these types of towns have sort of that small, musty bookstore with like creaky floors, right? Books just stacked from floor to ceiling. Are, are there any like really cool uh, bookstores in Eureka Springs? Boy, you know, I, as a books guy, I should know that. I don't think the, I think the answer is no, I've not run across them. If you're into crystals, there's a great crystal store. There's a lot of good art 
um, you know, there are a lot of local artists. It, it is really um, an arts community that translates into a lot of good restaurants as well. Um, but uh, so the local artists, uh, the 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 tourism shops or the uh, are, you know, for instance, there's a great sock store. Uh, you know, my my daughter for a while was big into mismatched and crazy socks and and they have one of the best sock stores that we've ever ever come across uh we had a guest recently who was big into crystals we had to drag her out of the crystal uh, the crystal store just because to, to kind of keep on to keep on schedule but um i was you know when i was uh, thinking about this uh and i was uh you know looking a few things up uh, i ran across a, a description of of eureka springs I'm not sure if you've heard of Branson, Missouri. Oh, absolutely, for sure. Uh, but Branson, Missouri, you know, it, it, it's close by. It's about an hour from Eureka Springs, a little bit, maybe a little bit more than an hour from Eureka Springs, depending on how we drive there. We sometimes go through Branson. Um, you know, Branson's this place where you go to go to shows and and that kind of thing. Eureka Eureka Springs is a place where you go to hang out, you sort of sit sit and drink a coffee, listen to some music. Um, Maybe you do some zip lining or go into a cave, but it's really more of a relaxing place to kind of chill out and enjoy the beauty of the of the area and the and the and the really the the beauty of the community because that's that that really comes across is that this is a group of people that really care about each other. You know, many of them have been there a long time. There are a lot of you know, it's not a transient population that runs the stores and owns the galleries and and so on it's a group of people that have kind of formed this this community and uh and are living you know they're living the kind of of life uh that's both melting pot and also um you know a, the kind of uh rugged individualist leave me alone sort of thing that the, the, those two pillars of you know what it means to be american one is to to let people live their own lives the way they want to live them on the one hand but also be there for them when they need help on the other. But we're unique in that regard, and 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 it really embodies we we Americans are unique in that regard um, that we can combine those two things, and and it really embodies that uh, embodies that spirit. If I'm not mistaken, the book over your left shoulder there is that De Tocqueville? Is that Democracy in America? Yeah, um, it's not Democracy in America. It's um, it's a, a book of essays on Tocqueville, though. Okay, great. I can just tell by the haircut that Tokyo has a very distinct haircut. So even on my screen, I could tell that was him there in the, in the background. But uh, all right, that's a fantastic place to leave this conversation, Fred. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, where can people go to, to follow you? Are you online, social media? Just uh, let our listeners know about that. Uh, I'm not on. I'm not currently online I, myself. Um, but we would encourage anybody who's interested in a new way of thinking about the first two years of college to go and look at hjc.edu. And then uh, otherwise, uh, you know, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn, or uh, I've got a Facebook page as well, but I don't use it very much. All right. Fantastic. Fred Franson, president, head of Huntington Junior College, part-time resident, Eureka Springs for the last 43 years. Thank you so much for joining us today on this episode of Forgotten America. And if you guys liked what you heard, if you want to keep up with what we're doing, go on, give us a five-star review on your preferred podcast hosting service. It makes it easier for your friends to find us and uh, kind of gives us the motivation to keep on going. So Fred, again, thank you so much. This was a wonderful, edifying conversation. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for joining us for this week's conversation. Don't forget to subscribe to Forgotten America wherever you get your podcasts. If you liked this episode, please leave a review on iTunes. And if you would like to support the production of this podcast, you can become a patron of the Cardinal Institute on Patreon or donate at www.cardinalinstitute.com slash donate.